This episode is brought to you by Pixel 2 Editions, a full-service fine art printing company. More about them later. Hello and welcome to In the Art Scene Podcast, an art podcast that has it all. I'm your host, Galena Marquez, and I invite fascinating people to talk about their personal creative journeys, success stories, and inspiration. We talk about art business and marketing, how to find your creative voice, and all the new trends in the art world, like NFT, AI, and such. Join me and my guest for today's conversation. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to In the Art Scene podcast. I am with Ingrid Huffmeister today. Uh, She is an amazing, amazing artist in San Diego. Uh, Yes, I'm going through my hometown, San Diego, (laughs) quite often because, well, there's no shortage of amazing people to talk to on the podcast. So Ingrid is a painter. Ingrid is a sculptor. And we will be talking more about this. Uh, And her... Her entire thing is to let yourself find your own voice, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to um, put the words in your mouth. I'm just going to kind of encapsulate what I feel from uh, your art when I look at it. It is so outwardly. It reminds me a little bit, especially your sculptures, remind me a little bit of Salvador Dali. And I know that you are hugely inspired by Carl Jung um, and and uh, his theories of dreams and um, uh, active imagination. So I'm really, really curious to talk to you about this. But please introduce yourself first in your own words, because there's no way I can do it better than you. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me and showing so much interest in me and my work. So that's a real compliment. Thank you so much. Um, Well, of course, yes, my art really does stem out of my interest and kind of lifestyle around um, active imagination. And Carl Jung has a big place in all of this because it began, I am a retired therapist, number one. And um, I got involved with a woman who actually studied with Carl Jung. She's now dead. She died at at 100 years old. Wow. And Katie Sanford happened to live in the area where I live. So the magic began because of her. And I was in a group and she didn't, well, she painted, but she never called herself an artist. She painted the most amazing large canvases by. working with her dreams. So everything you saw on the canvas was attached to her dreams and also her unconscious material that came forward. And I thought that is what interested me. I didn't say, oh, I am an artist. I've always been interested in art, but it snowballed (laughs) as things do. So it began really about me trusting my active imagination. I just had a canvas in front of me and didn't know what I was doing. I've never trained, but I've had a great passion and interest in art all my life. So I just began and, you know, it's almost 10 years later and I'm still doing it. And people like what I've done. I guess people have related to it. And, um, that's how it really happened. It's kind of a, an interesting way of working. I wish I knew more. There are times when I think, oh, I wish I knew technically a bit more. But I'm also afraid of having lessons. And yeah, that can put you in the box, right? Yes. And I worry about the critic on my shoulder. And, you know, we all have a critic, don't we? Whatever we do, you know, someone goes, that's not good enough or that's not right. And what I don't want is someone else to anchor in more of those feelings that I'm already carrying. So I've sort of got it alone. And um, I have had and I've derived such pleasure from it, personal pleasure. And the fact that you like it, as I said, is really like a bonus point to me. I never really started out. I call myself an artist now, (laughs) which is kind of um, a strange thing. But, you know, I've had some shows and I've sold work. So I guess I've had to own that. 
I don't know if that answers your question a little bit. It does. It does. And I have like I have so many questions right now in my head. And <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Now I wish I now I wish I took notes because I'm afraid that I will forget half of them as we're talking. But it's okay. I can always bring you back on the podcast if you are interested in coming back. Uh so yeah, I um let, let's rewind a little bit back to your upbringing. Uh, I guess everybody uh, guessed from your wonderful British accent that you were not born in the U.S. Uh, so you were born in England and studied in England. And uh, so... Um, well, I didn't study in England, strangely enough. I'm English. My mother's German, uh -huh. married to an English father. So I was brought up in England and educated in England. And I came to America when I was 35. And I'd always potted around, as I said, with an interest in art. And then when I came to America, I actually got my degree as a therapist here. At, uh -huh. you know, I, was, I think it was 40 before I studied. I never went to college in England at all. I was a yoga teacher back then and had family, children. How so interesting. I came, back from, I came from a sort of physical background, but also very, very interested in the thought process of, you know, um, what's behind yoga and all of those kinds of things. So that was kind of where I came from. And then I, I joined a group here in America of uh, Gestalt therapists. Mm -hmm. And the chap that was running it said to me, why don't you just legitimize yourself and get a degree, you know, because I'd, I'd done a program in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on therapy and the body it was called core somatics and basically it was a program which said the body has memory the cellular system of the body has memory and using gestalt alexander technique and feldenkrais movement we kind of worked learning really about how the body speaks so that's i came in through a door of physical let's put it that way and oh then God, so interesting sort of trained oh we love your cat in the background there. yes they, um, they they like to make cameo appearances <laughs> cute. It, could, it could be a leopard almost <laughs> um anyway so it's interesting i came through the back door of really the body and um very very interested in psychology and the body and that's kind of really and doors have opened for me along the way you know and but there's no there's no mystery to how i got to be a painter really there isn't because i'm doing really what i've always done and a lot of the work is kind of intuitive and that's kind that's a theme that runs through from 35 to now I'm 74 so I'm hardly a spring chicken I'm just kind of pulling together all the strings that I've been uh, working on my whole life you know isn't that interesting how everything like every experience at the end of the day just feeds whatever you're doing in the present moment I'm yeah. listening to that following yeah. those following those leads if you like and um and I've been for, but there's a great fortune in it because I've had the time to do it. You know, being retired and, um, you know, not having to be out there earning money or doing something or looking after somebody. I mean, um, I've had the freedom of time, and uh, that's that's a gift too. So. I am so excited. I cannot I cannot even describe to you um uh, I have an each in my entire body because you're talking uh, about all the things I'm geeking on, art, yoga and psychology. I'm like, oh my god, this is the right person today. <laughs> oh, it's it's but you know the your journey continues. I continue. I still struggle with what my work I mean it just because I it sounds all fluid doesn't mean that it's always <laughs> like that, you know sometimes I'm you know I have a lovely little story that I think can be really helpful to not please, just remind myself down. I have um, a Mexican friend Maritza Sanchez she's been quite instrumental in my journey as an artist too and she's, she's the an one artist. who became your mentor is that right yes she became my mentor, and I met her through Jungian psychology. 
her interest, she's a, a wonderful artist herself, and she's shown and she lives in Tijuana right now. But she believed in me. She saw something that maybe I didn't really understand myself. And she kept saying to me, Ingrid, yes, keep going. Don't give up. Just keep working. Just keep working. And one day she came to the uh, a studio here. I have, that was another thing. My husband had an office in one of the sort of lower bedrooms. And I said, I really could do with this space myself. And we switched things around. And I had, for the first time in my life, a studio, which is just basically a room, smallish room. But it was mine to make messy, dirty, leave everything around, didn't have to clear up. And that changed everything as well, because I work like that. I'm a messy worker, and I don't hate clearing up. I like to have things all around me. So anyway, she came to the studio and in the corner was a rolled up canvas. And I used to work with the canvas before it was stretched originally because I was working very large. And so the canvases were on the floor all over the place. And she saw this canvas rolled up in the corner and she said, what's that? I said, oh, no. I said, that's dreadful. I said, that's a terrible. I just can't work with that. I, you know, I'm just so frustrated. She said, why is it bad? Is it in the corner? Is it being naughty? What was what going on? I said, well, yeah, you know, I can't stand it. She said, get that out. Lay it on the floor. And I laid it on the floor and I walked across it. And she went, what are you doing? This is your heart and soul. You're treating it so badly. She said, no, this is so terrible. You're not taking yourself seriously enough. And you're, you know, you're being, you're being bad. That's all you can say. You, you're being negative. She said, I want you to reconsider this uh, canvas. Just keep working at it. Don't give up till you feel more settled. And I did. And it really changed things because I think she woke she woke me up to the fact that it's more than just a piece of material. It's not, you know, it's something to be respected and to, because the frustration, you know, you get frustrated, things don't work out. And you want to just sort of tear it up or, you know, or not bother with it. But I learned a little lesson there. So uh, not a little lesson, it's quite a big lesson, really, about appreciating what you're doing. I don't know if that... that that's a beautiful story. That's an amazing story. And I, I'm so glad that uh, you met her, who was your, like, the opposite of the critic on your other shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because we all have that critic. And we have this voice that says this is what it's supposed to be. And that's what you have to get rid of. And I think you just have to keep working from a different place. And it's hard because, well, life isn't always easy. You're coming up against yourself constantly, constantly. Wow. And um, that journey never ends, actually. I mean, despite all you what you know, it, you're still battling out yourself, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, that's we all true. Do it. We all do it in our own personal, private way. That's so true. I want to hear more about your inspiration with Carl Jung and uh, Jung in psychology. Um, what what sparked for you and uh, why was it important uh, for you to um, incorporate that in your work? How How did that work for you? Well, I think, first of all, for me, I love, loved what Carl Jung, how Carl Jung looked at psychology. And he was a very, very knowledgeable about um, the whole world, East and West psychology. He also, he doesn't box people in. In other words, the DSM, the DSM Diagnostic Manual for Psychology gives you a, um, you know, maybe you've got depression or maybe you've got, they, they put a box on you and a label because that's how insurance companies work and you have to be given that. Well, of course, back then there weren't such things and he didn't believe in boxing anybody and he just felt that we all struggle, we all struggle, and we're all on some kind of spectrum. These are my words, not his. 
um, that we're all on a spectrum of something. So what? You know, it's getting through life and it's finding your authentic self. And he talks a lot about the collective, which is the world that we live in and the influence of that collective. And then the individual, the individual that lives in the collective and how we get sucked in to the collective thought process. And Katie Sanford, who was my mentor who trained with him, she would say, there's nothing worse than dull conventionality because it kills. It deadens creativity. It deadens um, anything that's fresh and new because, you know, so it's finding, Carl Jung did a beautiful job of, working with individuation, trying and supporting, finding your own unique self, but also having a foot in the collective because we live in the collective, not going up against it as much as finding that inner strength. And there's a image that comes to mind, and I'm not a religious person, so I'm using the image of the cross, but not as a religious symbol, but as an ancient symbol. And the cross is the cross you carry within yourself. So if you were to open your arms out wide and stand tall, you have the shape of a cross. And that cross bears all the irregularities, the conflicts, the, the, the problems that you have to deal with in life, right? That's your own inner cross you carry. And part of what you're journey is about is creating the authentic self and strength to carry that to carry those conflicts because life is full of that constantly you know so I loved that image because I always felt that was so powerful and that the the inner journey is really about holding yourself and managing to live in the world as it is, even if you may not agree with everything or like everything. And so that's a simple, <laughs> a simple analogy, but it's a, a, a simple symbol, I should say, but I like it because I think it says so much. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I never, I never thought about it that way. And uh, uh, frankly, I'm not very um, knowledgeable in Jungian psychology. I, I studied a lot of Freud, and it was difficult enough for me. And I was like, no, I'm not going to read Carl Jung because it's going to be even more difficult. It's difficult. I'll tell you, most of the time, I don't understand it. I have to be really frank with you. There's a lot that completely goes over my head. Completely, I'm not an intellectual. And the vocabulary is quite, um, it's quite hard to follow some of the, the work, but we did it in a group and there was a lot of conversation. So it was very helpful. And the unconscious material, because in, in Jungian psychology, the unconscious is where the authentic lies. And so it's, interesting because when you're using it with art and you're allowing whatever it is to come onto the canvas there's a lot of trust involved you have to trust this process and I think that's probably what I've learned more than anything is how to trust the process and move with what the work is telling you it's a relational thing and, uh, of course, um, I've been working now for about five years or six years in clay. And that has been a beautiful experience for me, too. Oh, um, yeah. I have so many questions about that, so, too. <laughs> so nice. But, you know, it's, it's trusting yourself and taking the judge out as much as you can and just going with instinct. You know, is this okay? Isn't it? You know, I fail a lot at that. I overwork things because I think it's not good enough or it's it doesn't fit my standard of something. And that's when I'm usually ruin it. <laughs> and so it's um it's an interesting thing. I don't you know, it's hard to, to really, really talk about in some ways because I do it for the pleasure of it, really. 
it's become something I and it is the only thing because I'm really an extrovert by nature which is unusual for people who are Jungians most Jungians tend to be more introverted I'm a bit of an extrovert so when I'm working it is my introverted place it's where nobody else really is there I don't have to accommodate anything or anyone only me it's a, a kind of one focused thing is that I keep that? turning on and off my microphone because uh, there is a little baby. <laughs> you house. have a baby? <laughs> yes, I do. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> my husband is taking care of him, but he's babbling a lot. So <laughs> I'm turning I off heard my microphone. A noise. I did hear a little noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's amazing that you can do all this and have a baby. How old is your baby? He just turned nine months. Oh, a baby, yeah. baby. Yes, oh, he's. He's a baby That's baby. A he's, he's, he's just about to start walking. <laughs> oh my. Oh my. That's when the trouble really begins. That's oh, yes. Running around. Yeah. I, I bet that, that one is going to be a lot of trouble. <laughs> oh, that is beautiful. There's nothing like a baby. Nothing. Well, congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, but let's let's get back to you. And actually, uh, I, I do I do have questions about your um, clay work because it's absolutely fascinating uh, uh, for me. And and I have so many like I have so many triggers um, like firing up immediately when I'm looking at them. Especially your bust works with uh, women heads. Yeah, uh, but I I wanted to circle back a little bit and, and just stay with Carl Jung for for a couple of minutes. Um, it is very interesting how you are talking about this whole idea of uh, you know just trusting the process and uh, expressing yourself authentically. Because what I do like I, I don't know a lot about Carl Jung, but I do know about his work with uh, mandalas, and uh, he was using a lot of this visual expression in his work, and he was uh, he was making he was drawing mandalas himself and using it with his uh, patients and uh, and did like a, a whole research on that, which was absolutely amazing and uh i believe his process was exactly that so you kind of have a structure but within this structure uh you are kind of trusting the process of what kind of mark you're going to make it does become sort of uh you know symmetrical and cyclical but there is fluidity in it and there is um you know unrestricted expression um, so yeah, that's that's really interesting how what you're talking about, like to me, brings up that idea of Carl Jung. He was a quite artistic psychiatrist. He was an incredibly artistic person himself. And if you ever get a chance to see the Red Book, the Red Book is a huge book full of not just his writing. I'm talking now about his illustrations. It, um, really a I mean, an extraordinary man on many, many levels. Now, do I understand everything like you're suggesting? Absolutely not. I'm, he's way over my head. But there is some thread of recognition I have with him. There is something there that I can't explain it, but it feels right. And so I'm just listening to my intuition. and. Um, Following that, I'm not, I, I, I mean, I couldn't give a lecture on Carl Jung. I don't know enough, mm -hmm. although I've done years of reading and studying and things like that. I'm not a Jungian analyst, but everyone I meet who is, is so interesting because mythology plays a role, symbolism. There's so much of what I call the mystery, the mystery of what art is. Art is a mystery. There's no, you know, yes, if you want to copy a scene outside, you know, exactly, and you do a beautiful job, that is gorgeous, and you have to have a lot of talent, and you have to be trained. But my interest is more the mystery. So in my work, there's always something that you have to sort of look out, figure out for yourself. You know, it's like, what does this mean? Well, what it means to me and what it means to you may be different. So um, that's interesting to me, the mystery side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Maybe you wouldn't mind uh, to explain to our listeners the concept of active imagination. Okay. Well, I think um, 
I'm always very cautious of one thing, right? And by asking me this question, there's a little element of how to, how to do, right? Now, I don't like doing that, and I'll tell you why. Everybody's how-to is different. There is no how-to-do. Active imagination is playing. You play in front of the canvas, and you just allow your instincts to um, guide you. That's the mystery, to guide you. Why are you choosing that color? What are you looking at on the canvas that makes you create some kind of form why you know that everything like for me there's a lot of repetition around the female figure the feminine there's huge amounts for, for me personally now someone else going to the canvas may do something entirely different choose entirely different colors and images and that's their imagination i think it's trusting you just go and you let what forms in front of you be the director and it's you're in relationship with the canvas and your medium, and you just keep working. <laughs> so it's it's a flow, it's a trust, it's um, and your active imagination. The active part is is that you're constantly changing things and moving and. And, and you're actively working together in relationship with what you're doing. I think that's the best I can come up with. I know that uh, some of our listeners would be curious like, to ask the follow-up question, which I, uh, you don't have to answer if, you, if, if it's uh, too much or it's too challenging, because the, rarely anyone can actually describe. So how do you put in that? Uh, yourself in that state when you having a flow and just trusting a process how how do you get rid of a judgment well um you know i don't actually have the answer you just keep doing 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 it's the old story like i said about my friend who's i my my judge is still there i don't get rid of it off you know i don't always get rid of it it is alive but because i've done it so much now um I kind of know my own process and you have to just do it. It's it's as simple as that. You keep practicing and practicing and you keep working it. Some things you love, some things you don't. You, I, I go over a lot of my canvases when I talk about painting. I go over them and I've regretted that so many times when I, because I take pictures of it and I go, why did I go over that? That was, that was, that was what I wanted. I, that looked lovely. But at the time I wasn't in that place. I just thought, oh no, you see the judge, no good. No, that's not what I'm, you know, yeah. that's not what I'm doing. I don't know. And it's, um, it, it, it's me battling myself. It's the strangest thing because, <clears throat> and then you get work. For example, you're keeping, you know, you go, mm, not sure how I feel about that. And then someone else walks in the room and go, oh, that's my favorite. That's the piece I have. And you go, oh, okay, because that isn't the piece you necessarily think is your best work or whatever. There's no such thing as best work. See, that's got a, a qualitative thing on it. And I don't like hearing that. Someone says to me, oh, that's your best work. No, that's just coming from them. That's not necessarily true at all. Hey, In The Arts and listeners, do you remember Mark O'Donnell from Pixel 2 Editions? He's been on the show in Season 3, Episode 7, and told us everything we need to know about Gicle printing. And take my word for it, Mark and his team are the best in Southern California and beyond. I've been a client of Pixel 2 Editions since 2019, and I've been shouting about them from the rooftops ever since. Luckily, I don't have to do it anymore because I have a podcast. Despite being San Diego local, Mark and his team are working with some of the best photographers and artists from all states, including Clark Little and Kadir Nelson. And frankly, if you are a photographer or a digital artist, you don't need to be local to work with Pixel 2 Editions. Just use a file upload on their website for your heavy images and write down the specs. They can print small proofs for you on any substrate you want and ship them to you for free. And for my listeners, they offer a free 8x10 full image proof on metal. Just tell them that you heard about them on the podcast and they will take care of you. 
Let me tell you, their metal prints are amazing. Whenever I order mine, they fly off the shelves in no time. So I highly recommend you try it out. And oh, did I mention that they are a full service company? It means that they do everything from color correcting and printing to framing and shipping directly to you or your clients. So don't wait, go to pixel2editions.com, 2 is a number and editions is plural, or call 858-549-7299. Again, pixel2editions.com, 2 is a number and editions is plural, or call 858-549-7299. Say hi for me! That must be very interesting for you to see how other people from from the as a psychologist as a psychi- you're a psychologist not a psychiatrist right yes, uh, yeah so I think it, it must be very interesting for you to kind of see the reactions of people to your work and see what they relate to because it, it you know it's just well it's so it's kind of a, a window into it. someone else's mind almost yeah right? well. I don't, I'm not that analytical. You're, I, I mean, I'm making it sound like I'm, but I'm not. I don't really figure it out. I just go, oh, they like that. That That's enough for me. You know, okay. If you love my work, for whatever your personal reason is, this makes me so happy. Makes me very, very happy because I feel recognized on some level. Someone's identified with something in the work. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be, oh, my favorite color is pink. <laughs> and I'll, I'm going to get that because it's got a lot of pink in it. You know, I just go, okay. Even if they see it like that, I think there's more to it. That's the mystery. There's more to it than that. But I don't, anal- I don't analyze it. I just don't. It's like it, sometimes I laugh. Sometimes I'm more curious about certain things. And, there are people who may speak my language more and are able to identify that. And I get a kick out of that because that makes me feel good, to be truthfully honest. Um, if you love my work, I am very happy. And if you don't, that's okay. We can't all relate to the same kind of things. We're all different. So it's, it's an interesting journey. It really is. You can't have everyone like it. Not everyone's got the same kind of psychology or taste or so I just really it's very selfishly kind of do it for myself. (laughs) Do it for myself. (laughs) And um, you know, but there are things I've done. For example, I really don't like doing um what's it called? My other name's gone. When someone says, Oh, uh, would you do this kind of painting? Uh, A commission. A commission doing them but I had one really wonderful story there was a woman um who saw some work I did a little body of work on the bonsai tree and um why they you know was I sort of was it I I played and experimented and I kind of just got into the flow of these bonsai trees and I had a piece of work hanging in a gallery somewhere and someone saw it and they wanted to come around the house because that wasn't the colour they were really looking for and all that. And I hate that. You know, I'm like, mm. so they said, you know, here's a picture of a bonsai tree that we like, but when we like your backgrounds, could you do it for me? And I thought, can I do that? So I said, Here, here's what I'm willing to do. I'll paint what I love and what comes up for me using, if I can, those colours. Um, but if you don't like it, but no obligation. I don't want any obligation. If I like it, and I can only do it if I like it. I, you know, I, I can't, I'm not interested really in just making something what you want, you know, exactly. So this is kind of how I do it. And there was a very large canvas. And I said, that's fair enough, you know. The piece ended up being so terrific. I loved this piece. I loved it. I was like, my gosh. It just was magic. It worked. I can't, you know, don't ask me how, why. Everything went together, the background, everything about it. They bought it, put it up, and even invited me to the house for a glass of wine to see it. That was a lovely story. That was a way that I really enjoyed doing it. 
but I don't enjoy being asked to do something. I just don't. And there's no heart and soul in it for me to make, could you just make a copy of that but change that to green or what, whatever it might be. It's not that I couldn't do it, but why would I, you know? Yeah, I totally know. I, I'm kind of feeling the same way about commissions and, uh, and, um, I admire artists who just, you know, it's a skill. It's, you know, it's uh, the work just like any, any other work. You, you get an order, you get paid, you, you do it. You have enough skill, right? But if there is not enough joy, like I know for myself that I will procrastinate forever until the very, very last moment and I'll just put it together. Like, yeah, they're happy. I'm usually not. Uh, but, yeah, I, I totally, I totally understand how it's, you feel about it. Yeah, I know. I think this is the difference, and this is why I feel a very that I'm fortunate because I'm not doing it because I need the money to um, live off or something like that. I'm not an artist that's living off my work, so I'm in a very, very particular position which allows me the freedoms that a lot of other people don't have, and I do recognize that. See, you know, my mother always said, oh, well, you have such a lovely hobby. (laughs) (laughs) It's a great hobby you have. And it kind of, I suppose, from her perspective, it did feel like that. It wasn't wasn't what I did to earn money particularly. And and so it sort of fell into the category of hobby, which kind of I felt minimized it a little bit. But that's okay. That's how she saw it. And maybe that's how other people might see it, you know. For those artists who are working all the time to make that their life, that's probably, they might see me like that, you know, but that's okay, you know, it doesn't matter, you know. I I really love your mindset about this whole thing. It's like you cannot make everybody happy because we just can't relate to the same things. And no. yeah, it's it's really wonderfully put. No. And yeah, so, so how could, how could we? So, um, you know, that's why there's such great joy when someone does relate and they go, oh, you know, whatever that feeling is or you sell something, it's, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I'm always happy. I, I, the, the truth is, as my husband would say, I, I would kind of give it away to someone who loved it. That's kind of how I am. If you love it, you can have that. That is my payment that you really love it, you know. Um, and I have, you know, the selling part, all that is is always kind of slightly disgusting. You know, it's like, how do you deal with how much something is worth like that? It's really, that's the hard part. But um, I don't know. I, I'm just so happy that I can do what I do. And my clay yeah. women, I mean... They're my little goddesses. They're all around the house. My husband says, my God, I am completely surrounded by women. He is. <laughs> he is. You, you, took it, you, you took it off the tip of my tongue. I was just going to ask you about your clay women. Let, <laughs> let's talk about this a little bit. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I do hand building and molding myself. And again, I don't know why these faces emerge, but they do. But my love is as well, I add found elements to them. You know, after I finish the, uh, you know, why they're like this, I don't honestly know why they end up like they are. And I just love them. And I make these these um, women and, um, you know, I think, oh, I, you know, my mom said, oh, why don't you make an old person? She said to me once. Or why? I said, I can't because I can't go to the clay and say that's what I'm going to do. It's like my canvas. This happens as a result of me working. And again, you know, uh, it's they come forth. That's all I can say. These faces and these women. And I've done so many women, but I haven't finished. I know I haven't finished. And I'm not quite sure what that's about. But I've moved into animals. I've just finished a great big stag head. Oh, wow. It's in a show I've got right now with two other artists in Solana Beach. But I am loving my stag head. It's on a woman's body. It's not on my website or anything. But So I love putting together things that you don't expect to be together. You know, I use old plates and spoons and it's a sort of 
yeah I, yeah it, that's that's fascinating it's uh I, the yeah. way you were using found objects or like it, just a regular household objects in yeah. those cultures it, that's how did you get into sculpture um a friend of mine invited me to a class not too far from here right and um she, her name is Cheryl Tall she's a wonderful clay maker and she has got sculptures everywhere in all kinds of museums and galleries she's she's pretty well known and she has this um, studio. And when I went, the first thing I ever made was a woman's head using a mold. She has molds and you can play around. And I, I made this head for the garden and shoulders. And I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. And I thought, but then when I moved into my second head, the I had to rearrange the features. I didn't like the mold. I didn't like the way the face looked in the mold. It wasn't my, I didn't recognize that face or anything. So I kept working it myself. So in the end, I stopped using the mold after the second one. And I thought, no, no, I might as well just make the head myself. So that's how it did. And then I went on to YouTube because Cheryl is so helpful. But one of Cheryl Tall's gifts as a clay teacher wasn't really either to she instructed you obviously in how to build the coils and how to do things but she isn't um a person when i say how to she always left space for you to, for your own um way of working in the group that she's had for many years now we're all so different you would never believe this was all from the same students everybody's got a different style and that's because cheryl doesn't impose on you any kind of stylized way of doing things and i think that is why i loved going to her classes if you like she you were left a lot on your own and she would just help you when things went wrong or things need to be dry because they were falling over or helped you put you know, a stick in the face to keep it upright, all kinds of things like that. So, again, it's because that's what draws me into the creative process is when I'm allowed to express myself in my own unique way. And um, the ladies, my my last show that I've got, I'm, I'm calling, I call them Terra Femme, meaning Terra the Earth and Femme French for woman. Because the, these women keep coming up, and honestly, I haven't analyzed why so many women, but it's all to do with the feminine. These are, as well, um, I was going through some tough times recently because of a family member, and um, I made this boat. I thought I was making a bowl, just so you know. I started out, oh, well, I don't know what to do, I'll just make a bowl or something, handcraft this bowl. And it turned into a big boat. And on one end was the the head of a woman. Remember these ancient boats that had mm -hmm. masts on the front of women? Yeah, 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 so it yeah. had this big sort of uh, woman on the front. And then um, there was a woman seated in, it was almost like a dugout canoe. There was a woman sitting in that canoe. And I called it the Night Sea Journey because in Jungian psychology, the Night Sea Journey is when you fall down and you're into Persephone's underworld, when things are, you know, if people struggle and, you know, you have melancholy, sadness, depression, and you, you're struggling in your life and you fall down into the underworld, right? So I was going through a bit of that at the time and I made this boat and then the head became so important to me, this um, <clears throat> image of this goddess who I felt was the person that was going to steer me well. That and, and she emerged and I and she, you know, she takes a, a quite a big part of the boat at the front there. And she's very dramatic and very strong. And I thought, yeah, see, this is this is a story now about I'm going to be okay because I have this person, this goddess, if you like. Who's going to steer me? Okay, I'm not going to fall down into the underworld and stay there. I'm, I'm, it's, it's going to be okay. And, and you know, the, these are the things I trust. And so these symbols and images come up, 
And there's other things on it. It doesn't matter what they all are, but there's a bird and a nest. And because, you know, I have three children and grandchildren and there's, there's things going on all the time within the families. So yeah. it's very, very interesting. And I use it like that. It is really interesting. And, uh, you know, when I'm painting, sometimes I find myself like uh, drawn to uh, a certain image and, uh, you know, how like in the process, sometimes people are asking me, like, what is this about? Like, I have no idea. But then sometimes when painting is finished, it might even like after that can like a few weeks can go by and then it kind of becomes clear. And uh, but uh, the the reason I am probably that fascinated with your work is because I still tend to um, overwork a lot and you know uh, hover over details a lot i i just try like i want to try to be a little bit more loose and invite more of that flow and I, I feel like it's missing from my work yours is so fluid and the the women's head it's interesting that you were talking about the goddess that is going to steer you well because my question uh, as you were talking was like i actually thought that they were your self-portraits because they kind of resemble your facial features so um yeah, and it sounds to me like this is about and and the reason you you call them Terra Fam, like the women's of Earth. Uh, so it's it's about like inner goddesses within us, or in particularly the the inner goddess of you within you, and uh, the all the uh, trivial objects found objects kind of things that we have in our lives sometimes or being overlooked or not being being you know not being a lot of attention to uh, are kind of coming together it's like yeah this is still part of my life and that's that informs well, something in me it's like, yeah, i really i really love them oh my god yes. well thank you <laughs> but i'll tell you what i think there's another piece to this that i believe in no one else might see it someone might say like you yeah they they resemble me and and they're all me in some ways but i think they're me and my ancestors see i really think there's an ancestor part to this and um, it's me, it's my mother, it's my daughter, it's my grandmother, it's it's people from the past, from whence I came. There's something, this terror part of the fam is earth upon earth, what we stand upon, the generations. I don't know who all these people are. I don't always recognize them. Some I have, you know, I see people in them, my mother in one, I have something in the garden that looks like that. but. Um, I do think it's generational. And then the objects that I pick, a lot of these objects are vintage objects. They're found vintage objects that have a past. They have a story. I don't always know the story. Some stories I know, some I don't. It depends if it's stuff I've had here from little things I've collected. But it's all about the intertwining of the past too. I don't think it's it's current. I don't look at them and think, oh, they're of today. They kind of combine things. For me, for me, this is how I see it. And that's what gives them the beauty. And one of the things is I have always had a great love of doilies. Now, I don't have any around my house. Don't worry. You know, the little crochet things. Yeah, but I saw some sculptures with the doilies. Yeah. And I was going to ask All you about of that. Them like... actually have... All of them. Imprint. Yeah, there is a, I don't think there's any that don't have an imprint of a doily somewhere. And I've used it on the clay. I've used it also to spray through doilies onto canvases. And I've done a lot of that. You may not always recognize it, but <clears throat> there's something about that which is also the feminine. There's something about that part. And I don't know, I think I have a lot of, in Jungian psychology, we call the anima, which is the feminine, mm -hmm. and the animus which is the masculine or more the traits of the masculine within each individual man and woman. We have both. But there's something about me keeping going the anima part of me. And I think it's because I have a lot of animus. I think there's a lot of strong animus in me. And the anima is what I'm trying to give more life to, maybe, maybe. And... um but uh, there's something in that, but that's to do with my history. That's to do with the past. 
And I don't overanalyze it. I just go with it, you know? That's fascinating. It's really, really fascinating. And uh, the, f- the first time I saw um, women's head, uh, it immediately brought up the image of Salvador Dali's woman's bust with the bread on her head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of thing I would do, yeah. yeah. Um, and yet uh, he hasn't been an influence at all in my work. But I think just keeping adding things, and I'm not sure what that's about either. I'm sure I, I need to go into therapy to get someone to work with me on that. <laughs> but I keep adding things. Um, but I just find it interesting, you know. I just find it interesting. And actually, I love some of these pieces when I find the right pieces to fit and go. It's very exciting for some reason for me. And um I did some things as well with a bison head, the skull of bison. The skulls, yeah. Skull, and which I find fascinating too. So there's lots of still areas that I can explore and you know, it's it's doesn't have a beginning or end. It just can go on forever this, can't it, really? That's yeah. what's exciting about the creative process. It has no end. <laughs> That's fascinating. <laughs> it's really, really fascinating. Well, um, I have another question about the uh, the company that you used to have, uh, Play to Create. But before we get to that, I uh, just wanted to kind of tie all of that together because you started your story with, uh, you know, you came, you were um, a yoga teacher. So a lot of the things you were processing through your body, and then you uh, got into psychology. It was really interesting for you, how the mind works. And then you got completely into creativity and, um, and the sort of a, if, if I hear it correctly, or at least to me, it feels like that it's now it's bringing uh, some of the spiritual realm into this. So you're kind of, you know, your, your path and your past experiences, like all your life kind of ties everything together. So do you find that all of those elements are working together for you, like including the physical, the body in your current practice? Yeah, definitely. I feel like, um, yeah, all of the above all of the above and sort of as you look back and you see how those strings form a pattern um, that brings you to this place right now and that's part of exactly what we're doing when we go to the canvas and trust our intuition I trust that too I see that this is the journey and um, it's not always easy or simple or I'm making it sound that but it's kind of trusting the process and not always having to know the answer. People, you know, like to make, quote, goals. I don't like that personally. I'm not a person who says, oh, these are my goals, because I don't know, it could change. <laughs> I don't want to be stuck with something that today I say this and then I've got to do that or something. I'm more a person that's more flowing in the moment, and that's just the way I function. Maybe it's not the best thing, but it works for me. Um, I'm more as as something comes up, I will deal with that then. I don't want to it, it's almost my own fear. I don't want to be boxed too much. I'm you know, we're all boxed in. We all have things, you know, if you're married, if you live in a place or you have families and things, there are things that you have to do, and you know, that's fair enough. But what you can have freedom over I certainly want to utilize as much of that as possible and I don't always need to have an answer to things that's the biggie of the other thing because I do things that are quite irrational at times and also illogical my husband will tell me that where's the logic I go well there probably isn't any um you know I'm not a very logical person but it's kind of what I enjoy and it's the way that I function best and so I just go with it. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful message for everyone. Um, the majority of our listeners are artists, and a lot of us are, you know, at times struggling with uh, questions like, "How do I do this?" or "How do I approach?" or or the inner critic or um, the, the imposter syndrome or uh, like all of all of those things. I think this is a beautiful message to everybody to just. Yes, we are all boxed, and then the reality is the reality. Just embrace the reality and, and live in the moment. 
it's as not much as that you know this sounds all you know wonderful and it's not easy to do that's the problem yeah yeah and that's the battle you know i think there is a battle and and we're doing that through the creative process and that you know we're doing it all the time when we're creating we it, you you got you you come up against yourself don't you yeah. and i so i think it's a wonderful way of healing yourself and not to worry about knowing why this is the other thing I don't really always know why. I don't have the answers. I, I, it's more trusting that there must be some good reason for this, and I just keep going. Now, you know, I don't always know the answers at all. In fact, sometimes, you know, I don't really want to know the answers. I just, uh, yeah, it's just the way that I am. Everyone's different, you see. So my way is not necessarily the way for anyone else. It's finding what's uniquely the way for you. You see, my husband could never do what I do. He's a very logical thinker, detail-oriented. You need all sides of yourself. There are muscles I haven't used. You know, there are muscles that I need to use in the collective conventional world that I'm not very good at. Other people live beautifully in that conventional world and their muscles are strong in that side, but may be weak in the creative side. So it's finding a balance. I'm strong in my creative side but i'm actually have muscles that i'm trying at 74 to to build up in the in the conventional world whether it's your finances or whatever it is so it's not always simple you know you can't give up everything because you yeah. do live in that world you know? yeah and that's true that makes sense that's true oh wow um if you don't mind, I want to take a few more minutes of your time and and actually ask you about the uh, play to create. I know that uh, you don't do this anymore, but I think this is such a wonderful concept, and you have been doing this for for a number of years and have inspired uh, a great number of women. Well, uh, the reason it been play to create was a workshop. And it was many years ago, a friend of mine, a therapist too, wonderful creative woman I met writing because I did some writing as well. We did writing and performing your own monologue. We did a, we did a course at UCSD, uh -huh. uh, an evening course. That's how we met. And we ended up going into business together. And we were both, I was retired at the time. She was still working. Play to Create was the workshop we did abroad. We did it in Italy and we did it in Mexico in the uh, wine country in Baja. Uh -huh. And we took women and we did a, a collaboration with them. Again, it was not how to. This is a very big thing for me. We are not teaching you how to be creative. You are already creative. We're going to offer ideas and experiences for you to tap into your own creativity. So we did drama games, poetry, walking meditations. We didn't ever really paint paint. We included the psychological aspect of it. And the group put together, for example, we, it might be a three or four day retreat where you cook as well. You can cook there. We usually have the opportunity to cook. Um, so women came together to try to tap into who they their authentic self was and we used every kind of thing you can imagine as a process of working and connecting to yourself we didn't say this is how you do it we, everyone was that allowed the freedom to experience their own self within what we had to give them some structure obviously and that's kind of what happened we did that for quite a few years but then my friend bless her heart Savannah Sinkoff, she got cancer and died. Oh, no. And yes, yeah, so I never felt I wanted to continue without her as a partner. It was a really good collaboration and it had, we'd done our time together and it was beautiful and growing and fun and we got a lot out of it for ourselves as well. And so that's what that was, play to create. Oh, that's uh, wonderful. And I'm I wish I was there when the workshop was going on. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun and, and quite different. I think people on people want to be told what to do. We did get some negative response, which was, I thought you were going to show me how. 
You see, and part of our big thing is no. No. We are not how to because that kind of, again, constrains the potential, I think, of an individual. But it's hard because most people do want to know how to or go to a therapist to be fixed, you know? Yeah, yeah. I also, I, I don't I don't like that uh, when, when people say, yeah, I need to be fixed. They're like, no, there's, I mean, you're still going to no. do all the work yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, sadly, sadly, that is the truth. And then one of the things I... I know from myself is in the end, that's all you have. It's whatever change has to take place. You can't change others. That's not your task. You just have to figure out the best you can for yourself. Yeah. And that's a lot to take on. That's And, of course, we go, oh, that's so selfish. You know, you hear that. Oh, oh. And being creative for yourself is selfish. It, absolutely. It really is in some ways. but. I don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> well, Ingrid, thank you so much for your time. Thank we've you. we've talked for an hour, uh, and I feel like I I could be talking to you for another hour for sure. It's so so uh, amazing and so inspiring. Really, I'm so grateful for you saying Thanks yes to my invitation. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me. That was so nice of you. Appreciate that very much. Well. Um, with this, um, why wouldn't you quickly tell our listeners how to find you? And I will make sure to put all the links uh, and references to the show notes um, and uh, some some images of your work so people kind of have an idea of what we were talking about. Uh, yeah, but where, where to find you? Well, go to www.artbyingrid.com. Dot net. Oops, mustn't say that. Dot net. Dot net. Okay. Dot com. Yeah, dot net. Art by Ingrid. Dot net. Well, awesome. And also Ingrid has an amazing Instagram that you all need to follow. Um, I will link everything in the show notes. So go to intheartscene.com to the current blog post and um, see all the information for yourself. Thank you again so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for you. your interest and questions. Take care. Bye-bye. We'll see you in the art scene. Bye. Bye-bye. It has been another episode of In the Art Scene Podcast. If you liked today's conversation, please give us a good review on Apple and go listen to other great stories. Check out our website intheartscene.com or follow us on Instagram at intheartscene for more content. If you are a creative and you want to share your story, shoot us a message from the website or DM us on Instagram. Look forward to seeing you next time in the art scene.